And our next presenter is Dr. Uh, Jamie Monica. We're going to talk about rotator cuff and bicipital injury. Thank you. All right, once again, nothing to disclose. We're going to start out with the biceps tendon. So the uh, function of the biceps tendon is, is kind of a question. Um, so who needs the bice uh, biceps tendon? Is it the bodybuilder? This is a bodybuilder with a proximal biceps rupture. This is what that Popeye deformity looks like that, that we talk about. Uh, or is it the throwing athlete? Um, most of you may know the story of John Elway during his uh, Super Bowl winning season. He had biceps problems, kept getting injections into the bicipital groove, and then eventually ruptured the biceps mid-season on his throwing shoulder and felt great after that. All the symptoms were gone and continued to play and went on to win the Super Bowl. So the question of the function of the biceps tendon in the overhead athlete um, is, a, is, a, is a good one. Um, so it's been looked at. Um, Job did st a study looking at uh, EM an EMG evaluation of the muscles around the shoulder, uh, specifically the biceps, uh, when an athlete's throwing. And uh, what they found was that the biceps tendon actually, uh, or the biceps muscle, fires more in the, in the late cocking phase. And they uh, postulated that this uh, reduces strain in the IGHL, or the inferior glenohumeral ligament, uh, during this late cocking phase of throwing. So it does have an effect uh, on shoulder stability during throwing. Um, this was also uh, shown uh, in another study uh, looking at uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament strain uh, versus long head of biceps force in normal shoulders and also shoulders with uh, superior labral lesions. And we remember from the anatomy talk that the superior labrum is where the biceps originates from. Uh, so there is some connection there between the biceps and, and shoulder stability. Uh, a common myth is that um, uh, some may have heard that the biceps tendon acts as a shoulder depressor. Um, and that's really, that really hasn't been borne out. Um, that's uh, been looked at also with EMG analysis. And also, if you cut the long head of the biceps, uh, which is cutting it right at the anchor where it meets the labrum, um, in patients with massive uh, rotator cuff tears, you don't notice any further uh, superior migration of the humeral head. Uh, so that's kind of been disproven. This is just a schematic of, a, of cutting the biceps tendon there. So there's a big spectrum of disease. You could have the proximal biceps uh, rupture uh, in a patient without any symptoms at all. And uh, treatment uh, for those patients is usually nothing unless they are affected by the cosmetic uh, defect that's there. But then you could have, um, uh, it could be related to impingement uh, and cause problems with the biceps tendon where it is in the bicipital groove right here. And uh, that can be seen um, with inflammation on MRI around the biceps tendon. During physical exam, when palpating the bicipital groove, uh, that can reproduce pain, and that's often an indicator of uh, biceps tendonitis. And then also in surgery, arthroscopically, you can evaluate the biceps tendon. You can pull the biceps tendon back into the joint and look at it uh, with a scope and see uh, synovitis, redness around the, around the tendon. Then you could have tearing of, of the biceps tendon. Here's an example of that. And then further, uh, closer to the origin, uh, you could have a lesion, which is a labral tear uh, where the biceps originates from. Uh, this is an example of that. So initial management, uh, there's a lot going on in this slide. Uh, it just goes through different uh, aspects of treatment. Uh, it's published uh, this year in the Clinics of Sports Medicine. And uh, basically, it's physical therapy to begin with. You want to uh, separate out whether the biceps is unstable in the groove, uh, where patients often uh, describe like a, uh, a snapping with uh, internal and external rotation right in the front of the shoulder, uh, where, the, where the biceps is moving within the groove, and that causes pain, tendonitis, tearing. Um, all of those should initially be treated with physical therapy, uh, anti-inflammatories. A steroid injection can be very helpful. That's ultrasound guided right into the region uh, where the tendonitis is located, typically in the groove. Um, so those are your uh, initial, uh, initial non-operative management. And then when that doesn't work, 
Uh, surgery is an option. There are many ways to deal with uh, biceps, biceps tendon pathology. Um, there's open procedures that can be done where we reattach the biceps tendon uh, to the bone uh, with anchors, uh, distal to the groove, within the groove. Some advocate proximal to the groove. Um, personally, I perform biceps tenodesis uh, procedures distal to the groove because I think that within this area here is where a lot of the irritation of the biceps tendon can occur. So I, when I'm treating the biceps tendon operatively, I would attach it below the groove to avoid this region of uh, possible irritation. Uh, and then arthroscopically, it can be performed too. Uh, if you're going to place the biceps tendon above the groove, uh, just next to the articular cartilage here, um, an anchor can be placed, and then that could be used to secure the biceps tendon uh, proximally. Uh, these are just uh, further examples um, of uh, fixing fixation using anchors within the groove. So then what happens if there's a problem at the origin of the biceps tendon, uh, the so-called slap lesion, superior labral anterior to posterior uh, lesion? Um, there's a lot of debate in terms of how to classify uh, slap lesions and uh, what is a slap lesion, what's normal separation of the labrum from the glenoid. Um, and sometimes these lesions can be overtreated because of that. So what's the function or how do slap tears affect uh, throwing athletes? Um, uh, there are a lot of papers out there uh, looking at slap tears and throwing athletes. Andrew uh, th thinks it's mainly a deceleration injury in a thrower. Uh, Burkhardt and Morgan, other shoulder surgeons, think it's an acceleration in injury. Um, Kibler uh, thinks it's a failure in the kinetic chain of throwing. Uh, Walsh thinks that there's an internal impingement, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so th there are many different uh, theories on exactly what causes uh, slap tears in the throwing athlete. And then also, uh, like I mentioned before, there's kind of uh, there's not uh, quite a great uh, inter-observer reliability with establishing what is a slap tear, what type of slap tear is, is present. So there are different types of slap tears. Um, there's type 1 where there's just uh, fraying of the labrum. Uh, that usually is treated with just debridement as pictured here uh, arthroscopically. Type 2 tears uh, often uh, is, occurs when the labrum lifts off the superior aspect of the glenoid and those are often uh, treated with repair using anchors. Um, type 3 are, uh, it can lead to like a bucket handle of the labrum here uh, and that's often treated with just debridement of this uh, tear here. And then they go on to type 4 tears, which involves more of the uh, labral um, origin. And then type 5 tears, which can extend all the way down. Uh, this is showing a tear going all the way down to the anterior uh, inferior labrum. Uh, so typically, uh, when surgery is decided upon, these uh, tears are treated arthroscopically uh, with anchors uh, shown here. And then uh, questions arise, well, do they heal after you... Uh, put anchors in the superior glenoid and reattach the labrum, and this is just a second look showing that, yes, that does happen as long as the, pre the surface of the bone is uh, prepared appropriately. And then does it improve patients? So this was looked at uh, in a study looking at uh, professional baseball players, and uh, surgery uh, in pitchers um, does get them back to return to play uh, at a rate of 39% in this study. They looked at 27 pitchers that had surgery. However, the return to prior performance uh, was only 7%. So really surgery for pitchers isn't, it isn't uh, ideal with, in terms of outcome. Uh, the position players actually did, did pretty well with about half of the position players after surgery getting back to uh, their previous level of performance. And then uh, contact athletes with uh, slap tears. Um, this was a study looking at hockey players uh, who underwent arthroscopic labral repair, and all of them returned to, to play at uh, four, but before 4.3, or an average of 4.3 months. So just take home points. Um, the long head of the biceps is, um, is not an uncommon cause of pain. Um, frequently seen in athletes. Uh, Think of other pathology that can be associated with it, like slap lesions. Slap lesions are often overcalled, especially if an MRI is done. Uh, a lot of radiologists will see maybe just a little 
uh, if an arthrogram is done, a little of the joint uh, of the arthrogram fluid get underneath the labrum, and that could just be a normal variant. So uh, they can be overcalled. Uh, Bisubstenedesis is a reliable procedure uh, for treatment of it. Uh, however, you may want to consider not doing that in a throwing athlete, uh, given the function that the biceps tendon has in overhead athletes. All right, let's move on to rotator cuff in injury. Um, this really is a continuum of pathology, in the, especially in the throwing athlete, where um, usually it requires some degree initially of uh, increased glenohumeral motion. Uh, that often occurs from muscle fatigue, uh, leading to eccentric overload, leading to inflammation, and then eventual uh, tendon failure. Um, the dynamic stabilizing ability uh, that the rotator cuff uh, uh, imparts on the glenohumeral joint is lost and that can lead to other problems as well, labral tears, capsular lesions, and, and bony changes. So oftentimes in throwing athletes, uh, posterior muscles are involved uh, with overuse of the infraspinatus and teres minor. About uh, one times the body weight is placed on the shoulder joint during deceleration phase of throwing. It's enormous force and uh, posterior capsulitis uh, and stiffness often uh, precedes uh, posterior rotator cuff tendonitis, so that's something to look for in your throwing athletes. Um, impingement uh, is where you have uh, oftentimes bursitis or inflammation uh, in the region above the rotator cuff uh, seen in overhead athletes, and this can be just an anatomical cause from a spur uh, being on the acromion, which is right above. This is uh, kind of pictured here arthroscopically, a bone spur above the rotator cuff uh, leading to inflammation of the bursa. And uh, pain is uh, experienced with any overhead activity. And they have, uh, that leads to limitation of internal rotation, posterior capsular tightness. Um, and sometimes the humeral head actually migrates anteriorly from significant posterior capsular tightness. Initial treatment for this is uh, rest, uh, anti-inflammatory, progressive rotator cuff strengthening, and of course stretching the, the posterior capsule. Partial rotator cuff tears uh, in athletes usually occur on the articular side of, of the rotator cuff. Um, and it, uh, it can occur when the rotator cuff tries to resist adduction, internal rotation, and glenohumeral distraction, uh, which is most notable during that deceleration phase of throwing. <clears throat> Eccentric uh, tensile overload can also occur and cause uh, partial uh, undersurface tears from repeated microtrauma, especially at the supraspinatus. Full thickness rotator cuff tears in the athlete are rare. Um, in, in the young patient, often seen more in older athletes, um, and often from partial thickness tears that progress. Uh, the treatment for these uh, initially is often rehab and then open versus arthroscopic repair, um, and that's really that's surgeon dependent. Um, here's an example of a full thickness tear right here. Here's the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, this is the insertion here. This is where this is what's left of the footprint insertion of the rotator cuff here. There's also in this patient some evidence of uh, instability in this throwing athlete, where uh, they do have some uh, evidence of a, of capsular deficiency too. So the goals of surgery are you know to get the patients back to sports uh, with powerful function. Um, this is an example of what a tear looks like arthroscopically. Here's the rotator cuff, and this is where it belongs on the footprint. And then this is after repair. Uh, anchors are used, and the rotator cuff is now back on the footprint. And then whether or not you fix it open or arthroscopically, um, it really doesn't matter. There's been a lot of studies evaluating uh, the difference between the two, and there's really no good evidence to support um, arthroscopic repair uh, over open repair in terms of uh, patient outcomes. And then return to sport after rotator cuff repair. Um, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, uh, performed last year. Uh, they looked at 25 studies with 859 athletes. Uh, most common sport uh, for these athletes was baseball, tennis, and golf. And uh, on average, there was a return to play of 84.7%. And that was after a wide range, though, of recovery, 4 to 17 months. Um, and professional and competitive athletes did pretty well, actually. Around half of them got back to their previous uh, performance level. Um, internal impingement is something I just want to touch on. This is where um, impingement occurs between the greater tuberosity and the posterior superior glenoid rim. 
uh, with the shoulder in a, in a cocked position, 90 degrees uh, abducted in maximal external rotation. And the rotator cuff can get pinched here, and over time this can lead to some fraying or tearing and also labral pathology here as well. Um, and it's questionable whether or not this can lead to full thickness tears. Um, initial treatment for internal impingement is uh, uh, non-operative, work on proper throwing mechanics, uh, uh, concentric and eccentric strengthening of the cuff and scapular stabilizers, uh, and then you uh, avoid stretching the anterior capsule, work more on the posterior capsule. And then if it persists, arthroscopy is an option for debridement. Lastly, just looking at all, uh, all, incomer, all incoming patients with rotator cuff tears, not just athletes. Um, this was a study just looking at non-operative management, um, which showed that 46% uh, of patients in the study that were symptomatic had symptomatic full thickness tears. Um, I'm sorry, 46 patients had symptomatic full thickness tears. 59% of these uh, patients had functional improvement at two and a half years uh, without surgery. So. Um, uh, many of these patients can do well without surgery, even with a full thickness tear in uh, older populations, not, not necessarily your athletes. Um, and then 53% of patients with symptomatic full thickness tears, sorry, 53 patients, 74% of these patients reported slight or no shoulder discomfort at follow-up, um, although 56% had a satisfactory UCLA shoulder rating scale at, at 7.6 years. So, Symptomatically, they may be doing well, but functionally, maybe not as well, but still pretty reasonable and uh, certainly non-operative management for full thickness rotator cuff tears is reasonable. So take-home points for uh, rotator cuff tears. Rotator cuff tears are very rare in the adolescent athlete. Uh, it really would take a significant trauma for that, that to occur. In older athletes, though, it can be due to um, attritional rupture. Uh, and then causes of rotator cuff tendonitis in the throwing athlete are primarily due to fatigue and deviation from proper throwing mechanics. And uh, surgery should be considered in the athlete with a full thickness rotator cuff tear uh, who wants to get back to uh, their previous level of, of play. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, very wide range. What are the factors involved in that? A lot of, so the, the question was return to play has a very wide range in time. And one of the studies quoted was four to 17 months. And uh, there are a lot of factors. It depends on the, the type of sport. That was a very large study looking at a large group. So uh, depending on the type of sport, the position that the athletes are playing, and also um, complications that can occur. And we all know that one of the major complications after surgery for rotator cuff tears is stiffness, adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, same thing. And uh, that can certainly delay uh, return to play quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, not so much age, uh, more kind of like physiological age. So, and also, um, you know, obviously, patient uh, medical history. Uh, you know, older patients that are healthy um, and active, I would certainly consider repairing those. However, there's data that shows that the older the patients are, uh, the less likely, even if you do a great repair, the less likely that tendon is to heal. Despite that, there's also evidence that shows that the patients still do well, even if it doesn't heal, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, um, but in a patient that's failed physical therapy, failed steroid, uh, st you know, steroid injection is an option, still having pain. Um, if they're older, I would still consider repairing them. And also, young, younger patients get a younger patient, uh, forty-year-old with a cuff tear. Yeah, uh, forty-year-olds they tend to have um, uh, better tendon actually healing after surgery. So I would. I would be a little more aggressive in, in fixing a younger patient with a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Thank you.